Um, I've been wondering how I wanted to approach the subject this evening and have given it quite a bit of thought. But I didn't make up my mind until this afternoon after the opportunity to hear the morning sermon and to meet with people after the morning service. And I realized this morning, or early this afternoon, that while we are focused on a particular incident, that there are people in our congregation who have either thought about this themselves or have family members or relatives or friends who either have or are even now contemplating suicide. So I decided after some quarreling within myself that I'm going to take the big picture approach and I want to give you as much as I can in the time that we have that will be useful to you not only in processing this event that, that has befallen our congregation, but will equip you, hopefully, to be of benefit and help to others as well. Does that make sense? Okay. So, in other words, put on your seatbelts, because I'm going to talk a lot. This is a presentation I've adapted many times, but it's a presentation that I've used at a conference in Colorado, and I've used it with police and fire departments, and I've used it with churches, I've used it with the, um, with the IBCD, the Institute of Biblical Counseling and Discipleship, a modification, a shortened version, and, uh, and also uh, it been in touch with ACBC, the Association of Certified Biblical Counselors. In some of those settings, they ask me my qualifications, and so that's the list. And um, just, uh, just put it there to let you know that I'm not a novice. I've, most of my experience with suicide, I told someone this morning, in 47 years here at what is King's Cross Church, this is the first time I can remember. Gary, you've been here longer than I. Okay, This is the first time I can remember that one of our church members has died by suicide. We've had members who had family members or relatives or friends. <clears throat> I've spoken at other churches. When that has occurred, I've provided resources. Um, but um, this is the first time it's befallen us as a congregation. But in my ministry as a chaplain, 33 years with Bothell Police and Fire and EMS, as well as serving other agencies in the area, um, the number of deaths I have been to is over 1,000. The number of suicides I've been to is triple digit. So I'm not a novice. And the things I'm going to share with you may seem to be out of the norm, or at least out of sync with much of the cultural thinking about the topic, but hear me out, all right? We want to look at this, and I do this with police and fire as well. This is who I am. And, and I look at things from a biblical perspective. And I tell them, you don't have to agree with my perspective or my conclusions but I have a right to state them. And so we go. The key verse to keep in mind, I think, a key verse is Jeremiah 29, 11 to 13. This was not a happy time. Do you remember what was happening around the time of Jeremiah? What? Captivity. What? Captivity. Captivity, okay. People going into exile. 70 years they were facing 70 years of, of trials and hardships to endure. And Jeremiah writes, the Lord enables him to write, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, 
plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I'll grant you this was directed toward a specific people at a specific time and place. But I believe the principle is applicable to every one of us. What's the principle? That we need to persevere through distressing times and not collapse under the pressure. What's the message? That it's good, it's a good work to encourage people who think that life as they know it is over and to remind them they're not God. The Lord has purposes that we may not be aware of. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. And it's a good thing that that's true. This presentation may revive some difficult memories for some people. That's a risk. So monitor your reactions. Uh, Be prepared to talk with somebody that you trust afterwards if you need to. But I want to encourage you with this. It may also provide insight, understanding, and a measure of peace. Some of the questions that have been plaguing you might be answered tonight. I hope so. And you might have a way of knowing how to proceed in the future. What is suicide? Someone has said that the word suicide is without a doubt one of the most dreadful expressions in the English language. People wince at the sound of it and avoid using it to describe the tragic death it implies. Leprosy and cancer are spoken of in the same hushed tones. We don't really want to bring it forward. I can't tell you how many funerals I've gone to of people who have taken their own lives by suicide where the manner of their death is completely ignored. And people come to a funeral like that, what are they looking for? I mean, everybody knows it. What are they looking for? Answers. Answers. Maybe not answers to every question they have, but they're looking for something. They're looking for some acknowledgement of the abnormality of this action. They're looking for some spiritual confirmation. They're looking for some comfort. They're looking for some hope. And when in the service this is totally ignored, it's hushed, a couple people you can see whispering about it, it's a disservice to the people of God, and it's a disservice to all of the people who have come to that service. Yet it must be faced squarely and openly. I should mention these quotes are from Art Linkletter. Do you remember him, Art Linkletter? If you knew Andrew Crouch, you might not have known Art Linkletter. Art Linkletter goes back a little bit further. It must be faced squarely and discussed openly because it has become one of the leading causes of death among both the young and the very old in this country. No one can be sure of the exact figures because suicides are deliberately misreported and misdiagnosed as an accident. I have seen that. I've known that to be true, where people discounted statements that were made by the individual in order to squeak it by insurance. Link letter says, my own personal experience with it is still a nightmare. This is in 1993. The death of my 19-year-old daughter, Diane, that was in 1969, after experimenting with LSD, changed my life and the lives of everyone in my family. We still find it difficult to understand or discuss. People say, get over it. 
You don't. You never get over it. This was 24 years after the fact, and let me add to it. What does our link letter say was the cause of his daughter's death? Experimenting with LSD. There was no LSD in her system, according to the coroner's report. None. No drugs in her system. She jumped out a window. No drugs in her system, according to the coroner's report. And yet, Art Linkletter, big media figure, insists it was after experimenting with LSD. LSD was the cause. No. No, it wasn't. But you can't accept the cause. You can't accept the idea that a person made a decision to do this. And so you find something to hang the blame on. It wasn't her, it was the drugs. It wasn't her, it was somebody else who victimized her. It wasn't her, it's society. It's the culture in which we live. It's the, the uh, uh, failure of friends. We find something to blame it on. So what is suicide actually, describing it? Suicide is the intentional killing of oneself. Um, when a determination of suicide is made, they, they first try to rule out any accidental. Sometimes people kill themselves, but they do it accidentally. Accidental overdose, perhaps. Or uh, somebody, uh, um, I don't know, I don't want to give any other examples. But the, 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 the definitive, the definition of suicide is intentional. This person had a purpose in doing it. This, and so we, the, the, the investigators will look for any evidence of what the individual was thinking at the time. Is there a note? Um, on TV, there's always a note, right? You know how many people who take their lives by suicide write notes? Any guess? What? 25%. One out of four. That means 75% do not. No note. Nothing. We'll talk about those notes a little bit later. Suicide is a permanent solution to what may be a temporary problem. Think about the problems that we have in this life even the long-term problems, even a diagnosis of a chronic or terminal illness is temporary, isn't it? Because this life is temporary. It will pass. We may be in a difficult circumstance for days or weeks or months or even years, but it will not go on forever. So whatever problem we're facing that's temporal, that's related to time, suicide is an eternal solution. It's the end of life completely to what may be a temporary problem. Masaryk says that suicide is a social ailment peculiar to modern society. Uh, said that in 1938. That doesn't mean that it never happened before, but we've seen a rampant increase in suicide in the 1900s and in the 2000s. And depression is the common cold of psychological disorders, according to Myers. Let me throw this in here. Suicide is the fruit of dissatisfaction with life and with God's providence. People who are contemplating taking their own lives are unhappy. They're not necessarily depressed, but they are unhappy. And they're unhappy with their lives. 
and are unhappy with their lives and with the God who gave them their lives. So when we look at it that way, what is suicide? It's another manifestation of what? Of the essential sin nature that we all possess apart from the new birth. There are a lot of myths circulating around suicide and some misperceptions. One is that suicide is always caused by depression. A lot of people hear the word suicide immediately think depressed. Well, often other factors such as anger, revenge, remorse, that was the case with Judas. What is remorse? What? Regret. Regret, okay. Um, feeling sorry, being disappointed with what you did, but remorse is not the same as what other R word? Repentance. repentance. Remorse is not repentance. You can be sorrowful about what you did, you can be sorrowful about the uh, consequences of what you did. Judas was sorrowful about the consequences of what he did but he didn't repent of it. And his remorse drove him to do what? Do you remember? Yeah. He, he hanged himself. He hanged himself in a place called Akeldama. It's kind of a, a bloody field is what that refers to. Alcohol, drug and alcohol abuse may be more dominant influences affecting somebody's decision to take their life. Another myth is that people who talk about suicide won't really do it. They just want attention. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's true that somebody is throwing that up in order to get attention, in order to win sympathy, in order to get people to pay attention to them. But remember the story of the boy who cried wolf. Remember he kept warning and people grew used to it and then one day it actually happened. So my counsel is never disregard a warning. If somebody's crying out, uh, they may have a reason for doing that. Find out. what's going on. Another myth is that thinking about suicide means that you will commit suicide. Many people have fleeting, occasional suicidal thoughts, but do not act on them. Do you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes somebody is driving down the road and they just have a fleeting thought. What would it be like to just drive off the road, drive off the cliff, drive into a tree, to what would it be like to just jump if you're on a hike? Um, it just kind of passes through, but they don't act on it. But uh, it doesn't mean that they will act on it. The key concern is not the fleeting thought, but the key concern is dwelling on the thought, making a plan. Um, do I have a plan by which I intend to accomplish this? Another myth is that if you talk about suicide to a suicidal subject, you may encourage them to do it. Um, many people, if they hear somebody, if they have a friend that's talking about taking their life, what do they want to do? Don't talk that way. Hmm? Well, you might say that. You might say, don't talk that way. We'll come to that in a few minutes. But most people, if they hear that kind of talk, they don't want to be part of it. They, they want to avoid it. They'll, they will walk across a room. They'll go out of their way to avoid confronting that person because, well, why? Why do you think? They're uncomfortable with it. Sure. It's an uncomfortable subject. But why are they uncomfortable with it? They don't know what to say. 
And because they don't know what to say, they are afraid that they will say the wrong thing and actually catapult that person to commit the act. Uh, this is a very basic fear. It's understandable. But the reality is it may actually be a release if you're willing to talk with a suicidal person. It may actually give them the release that they need to stall that decision. They're looking for an outlet. It's like a teapot. The steam is built up inside. And if you don't let it out, then it will explode. Another myth, a true believer cannot commit suicide. Well, in our day, you watch the commercials on TV and the fast talk at the end. We get a lot of drug commercials, right? They always tell you, go talk to your doctor about this drug. Sometimes they don't tell you what the drug's for. Just go talk to your doctor about this drug and see if it's right for you. Uh, but then at the end, there's the, the disclaimer, and it's that rapid, rapid speech, and somewhere in there they say that it may, t may promote uh, suicidal thoughts. Years ago, many years ago, there was a very well-known pastor, a very powerful preacher in Birmingham, Alabama, and um, this was before suicide became such a... a more common phenomenon as it has in the uh, latter part of the 20th century. This was in the 19, I would guess 1970s, probably. And this pastor uh, took a revolver and shot himself. And what came out is that he had, doc his doctor had put him on a new heart medication. And when you look in the small print on the heart medication, Suicidal litigation was one of the possible side effects. And it was, it was a stunning suicide because this was a godly, godly man and it shook the faith of a lot of people. Can a believer commit suicide? That's different from should a believer commit suicide. There is, there is no justification for suicide, none. but there can be an understanding of suicide. That's different. That's not approval. But we can understand, in some instances, why someone might have done something like this. So there are medical side effects or other factors that may enter into that. Our Roman Catholic friends are quick to say that uh, no person who commits suicide can go into heaven. Why do they say that? Because they can't repent afterwards. Okay, because they can't repent afterwards. They see this as the unforgivable, the unpardonable sin, because in the act of committing it, they cannot repent. But, you know, they don't say the same thing about a man who dies of a heart attack while having an adulterous relationship. I've never heard that argued. And if you think about it, there are so many sins that we commit. Some of them are known to us. Some of them, in our current state of sanctification, we haven't even recognized it as sin yet. I, I don't know about you, but... You know, thankfully, I think most of the sins I was dealing with in my life 10 years ago, I'm not dealing with right now, but it's like I got rid of those and a new set has come up. They were there all the time, but I didn't see it. Sin is with us until we die. And if it's true that if we, because we don't repent of a particular sin, we are lost, then we are all lost. So we need to be careful of throwing that out there. Suicide happens without warning. Actually, most people do give warning signs. We'll talk about some of those warning signs a little bit later. 
You may be familiar with warning signs of suicide, but let me make this observation. I do believe that we ought to teach, suicide educators need to teach people the warning signs of suicide. However, having said that, in my field experience, you know when people recognize the signs? After the fact. After the fact. Very few people recognize the warning signs prior to the commission of suicide. Why is that? Their minds don't want to go there. Their minds don't want to go there. You don't want to think somebody is thinking about taking their life. And so they must have a different meaning. They, they can't mean that. They've got to mean something else. Then after the fact, you can look back and say, oh, that's why he was giving away his baseball card collection. Oh, that's what he meant by saying, you don't have to worry about me anymore. Oh, that's what he meant by, I'm fine. That's one, I'm fine. We, it's a very common, how are you doing? I'm fine. Sometimes that is a way of saying, don't push any further. I have plans and I'm not gonna let you into it. So. People give warning signs, but it, 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 it's often not read, and it's not true that suicide happens without warning. It always surprises us. Sometimes you have people that were close to an individual, and they'll say, well, I kind of wondered. But for most of us, we're just trekking along, and when we hear about somebody taking their life by suicide, to us, it looks like it's without warning. They didn't give off any signs. They didn't give off any indications. How can you deal with that? We'll talk about that later, too. But the most direct way is ask. If you think somebody is giving a warning sign, ask them. But won't that push them over the edge? No. It's counterintuitive, but again, as we said earlier, it gives them the relief to find somebody they can talk to. Another thought is uh, once suicidal, always suicidal, and that's not so. Um, I have come to appreciate the mandatory 72-hour hold that enables the suicidal subject to get past the critical period and consider other options. However, the mandatory 72-hour, or I should say involuntary, that's the right word, an involuntary 72-hour hold um, in which law enforcement places someone into custody of a mental hospital or something like that. I, I'm not a fan of mental hospitals per se, but it's a safe place, generally safe place, to stash somebody if they're actively engaged in talking about taking their life. And 72 hours is usually a time frame in which they can come through the critical period and reconsider their options. However, the 72 hour hold in the last, I would say the last 15 to 20 years uh, has become less and less effective. Do you know why? Okay. What happens now, whoops, I didn't mean to do that one. No, I don't want to end the show. There. Uh, what tends to happen is that when law enforcement takes somebody to the emergency room for a mental health evaluation, an MHP, a mental health professional, meets with them and that mental health professional is looking for key words. The individual must say they're going to harm themselves or they must say they're a threat to someone else. And if they don't use that language, if they don't use those terms, they can't hold them. Even though I remember being called out on a, on a scene with a woman who was suicidal and uh, she had, uh, it was in um, Lake Pleasant in Bothell, a little campground. 
And she was there in an RV, and police were called, and I was called, and uh, I sat down with her, and we talked. And she was intent on taking her life. She told me she had a plan. I asked her about her plan. She told me what the plan was. The plan was lethal. And, uh, and I suggested to our sergeant, we take her in. We took her in. She got in with a mental health professional. And a prof mental health professional asked her, are you this? Are you that? Her response was, well, I was, but I'm not now. And released her. I mean, it's about a 15-minute turnaround. And Sergeant and I drove her back. And I decided to stay with her a little bit. And um, we sat and we talked. I got her talking about her background. She had a Southern Baptist background. And I reminded her of some of the things she learned as a kid in Sunday school and some of the songs she sang and things like that. But it was now early in the morning, like 2 o'clock or something like that, and, and I can't stay all the time. And I, I looked at her and I said, you're going to do it, aren't you? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, I can't, I can't stop you. But I'm going to pray that you don't. And I'll pray with you. And I'm going to urge you not to. And I went home. That was a Friday night, early into Saturday morning. I fully expected to get a call about uh, 8 o'clock when somebody found her. And the call never came. And I thought, well, I wonder what happened there. Came to church Sunday morning. Guess who showed up? Yeah. She came to church and uh, told me that she had done what I had suggested. She had thought about the things that, that uh, were part of her youth, the relationship that she thought she'd had with the Lord and realized that she didn't really have a relationship with the Lord and she sought the Lord. And she then um, returned. She, uh, she was here from another state. She returned home. And uh, every year, uh, this was uh, the, what, what caused her to be that reflective and that down is that at home, several years before, she was backing out of her driveway, did not see her little daughter on the tricycle behind her and ran her over and killed her. And so every anniversary date, she would go off someplace and camp and be by herself and drink and take medications. And for years afterwards, she wrote me every, every anniversary date to let me know, I'm still here, I'm in church, God is good. God is good. So we need to talk to people. Some people think the risk goes down when the mood goes up. There is a curve that um, I've noticed with respect to, this is true especially when there's depression involved, where you're, you're on a, if I do it that way, you're on a kind of level ground, this is your, your baseline, and you go into depression and you go down, 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 and then you sink into a deep depression and then it kind of bottoms out. When somebody is at that stage of depression, uh, when they're on the way down, they are in a danger zone because they're forming a plan and they may act on it. They've still got the energy to act on it. When they bottom out, they're at a place where they don't have any energy. This is where they're, they're just in bed all day, they can't get up, they, they don't want to do anything. And then they start to feel a little bit better. They're kind of coming out of it. They're coming out of the curve. They're starting to come up. And right in, right in that curve, right there, right at this point where they're just coming out from the bottom, starting to come up, guess what? They're acting happy. People are saying, oh, they're doing better. They've regained some energy. They're not lying in bed all day anymore. Yeah, they've regained some energy. They've made their decision, and they're committed. And they're at peace with it because they've made a decision. And that's another danger zone right in there. So these two places in that curve 
as we observe the relationship. So the mood may improve, not because they're doing better, but because they have made a decision to proceed with the plan that they had in mind. So when you see somebody who has been suicidal and they're coming out of their depression and they seem to be doing better, ask them why. Why are you doing better? Why do you feel better? Have you made a decision one way or another? And they may tell you, yeah, I, I don't know what I was thinking. I, I never should have gone that direction. Or they may tell you, yeah, I've, I've made my decision. But you need to find out. Suicidal people are intent on dying. No, uh, they don't have a death wish. No suicidal person that I've talked to wants to die, per se. You know what they want? They want not necessarily to stop living. They want to stop living the way that they are. That's different. In other words, they want their life to change. They want something to be different about their life. And they either don't have the will to pursue it or they don't know how to pursue it to bring about the change in their life that they want. They are dissatisfied with life. They want it to change. More often, they want out of the pain. They want deliverance. They think they're out of options. And they are out of hope. People who are suicidal develop tunnel vision. Do you remember what tunnel vision is? You don't have peripheral vision. You don't see things out here to the side. You're focused, so entirely focused, on this one option that you're not willing to hear other options to resolve the issues that you're facing. They don't hear it. Another myth is that suicide runs in families. That's because often when one person in a family has taken their life by suicide, down the road or perhaps even in immediate proximity, there will be others who do. It may have been a grandfather who did it and now a grandson does. It may have been a son who does it and now a cousin does. But what's involved there is not heredity. What's involved there are patterns of life and permission. By that I mean if Uncle John, I have a, my son is John, we have an Uncle John. If Uncle Fred, we have Fred. <laughs> if Uncle Gustav <laughs> takes his life, then it's like, that, if I'm thinking in that direction, that gives me permission. Good old Uncle Gustav solved his problem this way, and that means that, that I can do the same. So it's an issue of permission. All right, one more. Suicidal people must be mentally ill. The uh, state of Nevada back in 2007, put together a suicide prevention plan. Nevada has a high rate of suicide per 100,000 population. Uh, did then, still does now. Uh, has, there are reasons for that. We'll maybe talk about that a bit later. But, um, whoops. Uh-oh. I think I can get back. Nevada put together this suicide prevention plan that uh, was a five-year plan that was supposed to reduce the number of suicides between 2007 and 2012. In that plan, in that document, they wrote that 90% of people who die by suicide have a diagnosable mental health and or substance use disorder at the time of death. Now, that sounds pretty definitive, doesn't it? Pretty authoritative. You've got a state agency declaring 90% of people who died by suicide 
have a diagnosable mental health issue. Four sentences later, it acknowledges that over 90% of the people that died by suicide in Nevada had not been seen by a mental health professional. Who diagnosed them? How were they diagnosed? It's a circular reasoning. We make the declaration that people who take their lives are out of their minds, they're mentally ill, and then we prove that by saying all these people that took their lives are mentally ill. It just goes round and round and round without any statistical or scientific proof. But it's a common myth. We have shifted from a pattern generally in the culture where things that the Bible has called sin are called sicknesses in our day. Um, Bible talks about an unflattering term for people who abuse alcohol. What do they call them in the scriptures? Drunkards. Drunkards. But we know better, and they're just sick. They're people who are mentally ill, they're addicted, and I'm not denying that there are addictive qualities to drugs and alcohol and so forth, but it begins with a choice. And once you go down that road, it's hard to get off that road, but you made a choice to go down that road, despite the warnings. But when we do that, when we declare sins to be mental illnesses, we, we talk about, uh, oh, you know, um, I'm trying to think of the term, but um, uh, there are, are people who uh, are given over to immorality sexually, and there's a, a term for that. I can't think what it is right now, but, but uh, we have these medical terms for common sins. Why? Do we do that? We do that in order to remove guilt. People who are sick are not guilty, right? Somebody has measles or mumps or, or COVID or cancer, we don't hold them accountable for their disease. We have sympathy for them. We feel sorry for them. And, but we don't think of them in terms of being culpable or responsible for their behavior. And so we do that with respect to people who die by suicide, and we ascribe no guilt to them, no responsibility to them. But we feel like somebody's guilty. Somebody should be blamed for what took place. So what do we do? We spread it out. We all take a piece. We all take a piece. I should have, we should have seen it coming. I should have invited him to lunch. Gustav was, was my friend. I should have invited him to lunch. What if I had invited him to lunch? We play a what if game. What if I had said this to him? What if I had not said that to him? What if I had, what if I had? It goes on and on and on. And we all take a bit of the blame. Even people who don't know Uncle Gustav will think, well, you know, he was the guy that I used to see when I went to the delicatessen. And uh, it was a German delicatessen. <laughs> and uh, I, I should have, uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen him a couple times. I should have introduced myself. Maybe I could have had a conversation with him that would have changed the outcome. Um, we take the guilt on ourselves. Some statistics, this is from 2017 actually. Um, there are in 2021, 48,183, there were 48,183 confirmed suicides in the US. And that's over, I adjusted these, that's over 132 suicides every day in America. That's 5.5 every hour, and that's one suicide every 11 minutes. 
not 11.9, every 11 minutes. And that's round the clock. Not that it occurs round the clock, but there are patterns. But that's the magnitude of the problem. Back in 2009, for the first time, more people died from suicide in America than died in traffic accidents. And that remains true. In 2009, suicide passed traffic accidents, and it has stayed above that level. The group at highest risk of attempting suicide is, who would you think? Women. Women are 10 times more likely than men to attempt suicide. They are not um, that span likely to succeed. The group at highest risk of succeeding is what group do you think? Men, specifically white males, ages 15 to 25, and then ages 55 to 65. Think about that for a minute. 15 to 25 and 55 to 65. What's going on at 15 to 25? Marriage, early career. Marriage, early career. Finishing high school, finishing college, moving out, opening up the world, getting a job, um, all the pressure of that transition. What's happening at 55 to 65? Profession is ending. Profession is ending. You're done. Uh, your company no longer thinks you're useful, and uh, maybe other people don't either. Your own uh, thoughts about yourself may be uh, going downhill from there. Your health is going downhill, maybe going downhill from there. And um, it's trending younger in both groups. Uh, this is 2017, um, the U.S. suicide death rates. The death rate now is 14.1 per 100,000 nationwide. And... Uh, Washington, which was 23 at 15.9 per 100,000, is now at uh, 27th at 16.6 per 100,000. These are Denver County statistics. Let me just see um, some comments. Firearms are the most popular means. Firearms. Uh, that's in Denver County in 2015, when I could get statistics. Right now, nationwide, firearms are the most popular means of committing suicide at greater than 50%. You know why the increase? What? Well, it, it, that is a, the choice because it's quick and it's definitive. But there's something else going on here that I want to call attention to. And it is that um, historically, there have been differences between men and women. Women have made more attempts, but with less lethality. What has been, in the past, what has been the most common means for suicide among women? Pills. pills, okay? And when you take pills, somebody can find you, and they can revive you. So back when I did this, firearms were at 34% in the county, and that was pretty reflective of the nation. But, um, but a different methodology was rising with women. Women, another reason they, they do pills, frankly, I, this will sound weird, but I've talked to too many people to discount it. Um, women are more concerned about how they look and about how they're found. And they don't want to look a mess 
and they don't want to leave a mess. And so pills is a very clean way of dealing with that. However, back in when I did this presentation, another method was rising, and it became the most popular method among women, which was hanging. Hanging is number two nationwide. But the rise in firearms is due to women. Women, more and more, are resorting to firearms in order to accomplish this goal. Denver County, Arapahoe County. What are some reasons why people take their own lives? We've mentioned depression. Everybody thinks it's depression. But I have found anger. I'll show you. Jealousy. Depression. Self-pity. It's the ultimate act of autonomy. It's my life. I can do what I want with it. It's my body. Concern about lack of status or income, or power. People lose their job, and uh, some people, it pushes them over the edge. Loneliness. People routinely list loneliness as the number one problem. We live in a, in a, in a world that talks about overpopulation, and the biggest problem is loneliness, because people feel very isolated and cut off from each other. Rejection. Pride, being bored, loss of meaning in life, shame, guilt, revenge, accidental drugs, uh, sexual asphyxia. I've seen um, the youngest sexual asphyxia suicide I've seen was a young man who was 12. In order to avoid greater pain, bad theology, yes, bad theology can be responsible for suicide. Back in, uh, let me just, uh, I think I have it here, yes. In 1977, there was a double suicide on Mercer Island. Some of you might remember it. When I begin talking about it, you might remember it. And uh, it, was, it was a young couple named Jason and Don. Jason and Don were 15 and 16. Don was 15, Jason was 16. And they were in, guess it? They were in love. They were in love. And. They had this plan. They were in 10th grade, and they were going to drop out of school and get a job, get jobs, take an apartment, and begin making their way. They were going to work at uh, Jack in the Box to pay for all of that. Don's dad said, "No." The couple drove around on Mercer Island talking. They had been reading a book called The Adventures of a Reluctant Messiah. Do you remember that title? Richard Bach. Bach's premise in the book was that Jesus was a great illusionist that Jesus had learned the trick, that that we're in a multi-level universe, and Jesus' miracles were not miracles, but Jesus had learned how to transition from one dimension into another dimension and back. Okay? Essentially. It was fiction. They believed it. 
And they decided that if they took their lives, they would simply pass into another dimension where they could be together and her dad could not say no. So they drove their car into a brick wall at the school they attended at something like 100 miles an hour, instantly killing both of them. That's sad. Based on a wrong view of Jesus, based on a wrong view of God. Let me go back here again. Divorce or the death of a spouse Some of you have been through one or the other of those experiences. Uh, They're both horrible. They're both terribly distressing. Bad relationships and plain old stress. The thing is that all of these things are, what did I call them? These are Reasons. Reasons. The point I'm making is that we commonly believe that suicide is an irrational act, and I'm telling you that what I find in talking with people who are suicidal or reading suicide notes or talking to people who love somebody who died by suicide is that it is not irrational to them. They have reasons. The reasons may not be sufficient to justify the act, the reasons may not be very good reasons, but it is not irrational. And when you're dealing with somebody, if you treat them as if they're out of their mind and you're trying to help them, you know what you've just done? You just close the door. I can't talk to you. You think I'm, I'm crazy. You think I'm out of my mind. You have nothing to offer me because I know I have reasons. So be careful of that kind of thing. What do all these people have in common? There is really only one reason why people commit suicide, says Gavin De Becker, who is not, I don't think he's a Christian, but in a book, a great book titled The Gift of Fear, De Becker argues that, that fear, which none of us likes, but fear is a something that preserves us. And he argues that that fear really is a gift from God to help protect us. He states there's only one reason why people commit suicide. Most of them have not lost their minds, but all of them have lost hope due to sin. This is the curve I was talking about. The most dangerous places are here, And here, when they're coming up out of the bottom. Um, Alcohol and drugs, I'm not going to go through those statistics, but uh, there are many people who uh, kind of uh, um, try to strengthen their resolve by using drugs or by using alcohol. They think it will make it easier to do it. 56.4% of men, 67% of women tested positive. There are something called chemical detergent suicides that started in Japan in 2008, then came to the US. I'm not going to go into that, except uh, to note, uh, well, I'm not going to go into it. It's taking common cleaning agents and combining them. And uh, there have been cases where uh, what they've gone to, and you can actually even find this online. You can find a warning sign online that you can put on the, the, the door of the room you're in or put on your car because uh, somebody coming in to open to get you out, they see you unconscious, they want to come in and get you out, uh, one whiff can kill them. That has changed the way we, that we in emergency services respond to an unconscious person in a car. We've, we've got, to, got to be more careful. What do we think of suicide? Some cultures tolerate and some even encourage suicide. Uh, These states have physician-assisted suicide laws. Uh, Washington's Death with Dignity Act states the patient's death certificate shall list the underlying terminal disease 
as the cause of death. So these suicides are not even counted as suicides. This was in a um, Nevada uh, paper when, uh, when I was speaking in Nevada, and uh, I thought that was interesting. This was years ago, but uh, where are we now? Vending machines with needles and drug paraphernalia and Norcan. Augustine framed the early response to the church to suicide. It's a violation of the Sixth Commandment, murder. It's an assault on the image, the image of God. It's a sin with no possibility of repentance and a cowardly act. Aquinas argued further, suicide is unnatural. It's against the will to survive. Suicide is an offense against the whole community, affecting many people. Uh, suicide is like taking a, a rock and throwing it in a pond and you just watch it spread out all the way across the pond. And uh, there are you know, a huge number of people that are affected by a single suicide. And suicide usurps God's power and authority over life and death. On the surface, it seems to be about death. But the reality is, if they succeed, they will die. But suicide is really about life. And the dissatisfaction with living that somebody has. They want to change. They want something to change, but they don't know how, and they can't effect the change that they need. Uh, origins go back to Genesis temptation that uh, we will be as gods, and then suicide, that's exactly the role that the individual is taking. The common thought today, reflected by Thomas Sass, is a man's life belongs to himself, hence he has a right to take his own life. That is, to commit suicide. Whereas a Christian counterpart says that suicide is a personal assault against the sovereignty of God in all the affairs of human life. The suicide declares that she has a sovereign rule over her life and a sovereign reign over her death, neither of which is true. Our lives belong to God. There is no God besides me. I put to death and I bring to life, God says in Deuteronomy 32. There are seven suicides in the Bible, six if you don't count Samson. Samson is often viewed not as a suicide, but as a sacrifice in order to save the lives of others. But it was an intentional taking of his own life. Um, various reasons. In this case, uh, the, the, it says, draw your sword and kill me so they can't say a woman killed him. Um, there's Samson's death, Saul, Saul's armor bearer. They didn't want to be taken in battle and disrespected. Uh, Hithophel uh, saw that he had fallen from grace, fallen from power, fallen from authority. The king was no longer taking his counsel. And uh, so he put his house in order and hanged himself. Zimri, when he saw that the, the city was captured, he went into the citadel and set it on fire. So he died because of the sins he had committed doing evil in the eyes of the Lord. Then there's Judas, we talked about. And uh, how can you respond to suicide? There's suicide prevention, suicide intervention, suicide postvention. That language may not be familiar. Suicide prevention is what can you do to prevent a suicide from taking place. Suicide intervention is intervening in a suicide that is in progress, ending it. Suicide postvention is dealing with the after effects of a suicide. I'm going to roll through here. If you want to talk about, I'm looking at the time, if you want to talk about some of the uh, signs of suicide or some of the ways you can be helpful to somebody who is suicidal, um, the book uh, Help My Friend is Suicidal uh, covers a lot of the material that's here. Uh, to prevent a suicide, know the warning signs. Be willing to talk about suicide, that's key. Show genuine care and concern. Ask if you need to ask, do you have a plan? What is your plan? Um, we had somebody that uh, was attending our church. He was actually from Fairfax, a psychiatric hospital across the street. And he would come over on Sundays and uh, attend our church. And uh, he was at times suicidal, but his favorite method of suicide was aspirin. 
and he knew exactly how many aspirins he could take that would not be lethal. If you take enough, it can be lethal. Actually, it, it eats a hole in your stomach. And he did this multiple times, and he would be taken into the hospital, and they'd care for him, and then he'd come back out, and he'd be fine for a while. But uh, eventually, uh, he stopped coming here, um, and uh, I learned that, uh, well, he called me. He was very, very sick. In fact, doing that so many times had taken a toll on his stomach. He had a hole in his stomach that they could not heal, and he was dying. Um, be willing to talk about it. Show genuine care and concern. Ask, do you have a plan? If I ask somebody, what's your plan? And they say, I'm going to take, uh, I'm going to overdose. What are you going to overdose on? Vitamin C. Had somebody who said that. Not too worried about overdosing on vitamin C because vitamin C is processed by the body and released in urine. Um, it's not a danger. I don't think it's, uh, it might make you sick, but, uh, but it's not lethal. What do suicidal subjects want? Take others seriously, but not discounting their concerns. When somebody tells you it's bad, don't tell them it's not. Because their reaction will be, you don't believe me. I can't trust you. Take them seriously. How bad is it? Why is it so bad? Somebody told me once that they thought they were at zero. So I asked them, what? That, that's pretty serious. You know, most people would... You're, you're a good father, you're a good husband, you're a good worker. What do you, what do you mean you're a zero? I asked him, that's pretty serious. What, what makes you think you're a zero? You must have good reason. And he opened up. And we could deal with it. But if you can't get it out on the table, you can't deal with it. Don't tell them what to do, but show them biblically what God wants them to do. That's what we mean by biblical counseling. We're showing people what God says, bringing the, the gospel to bear, bringing the scripture to bear upon their specific subject. Counseling is a part of the ministry of the word. Preaching is like, like taking that Roman big broadsword and you're standing in the pulpit. Pastor Nick is very good at not being harsh with that broadsword. but You're standing with the pulpit with that broadsword. But in counseling... You're making general observations, general applications from the pulpit. But when somebody comes to you with a specific issue, specific problems, then you're taking that Roman short sword and you're, you're dealing close and intensely and personally with that individual, bringing the appropriate scriptures to bear upon their particular issues. What they lack is hope. What they need is hope. We obtain hope, Romans 15, from the scripture and from the God of hope. Where there is faith in God and his word, there's hope. Where there is hope, there's life. Where there is no faith in God and his word, there is no hope. And where there is no hope, there is death. False hopes, hope is not within ourselves. It's not in others. It's not in our circumstances. Life is ever-changing. Friends come and go. Loved ones die. The perfect job turns out not to be perfect. We have injuries that don't heal. We have illnesses that can't be cured. But God is our source of hope. So let me move on. Intervention places you in harm's way, and you must always be concerned for your own personal safety. I'm not going to try to get too much into that. There are some tools that can be used that I use, and uh, other people who are dealing with suicidal subjects can use. Some things to do, don't leave the person alone, don't overlook verbal and behavioral signs, don't sound shocked, even though you may feel it. Don't interrupt while the person's still speaking. You're buying time. Let them talk. Don't make promises you can't keep. Don't argue. Don't debate the morality. Don't remain the only person helping. Call in somebody. And don't agree to keep it a secret. We cover it up. I tell people with respect to confidentiality, confidentiality as I define it means you have confidence in me 
that I will use whatever information you give me appropriately. That's it. And uh, I, I won't promise that I'll never tell anybody anything that we talked about because people will use you to dump on you. And they will feel better because they got it off their chest, but they left you holding the bag with a promise that you won't tell anybody. There may be times when you need to bring in somebody else in order to help them. Do pray without ceasing, be calm, be patient, define the problem accurately. I want to move through, yeah, call 911 if it's imminent. Let me move to postvention because that's kind of where we are with our situation. Suicide is the most traumatic of deaths for survivors. If you were to, to rank deaths, we understand death is a, a, a fruit of the fall, right? And that all men die, everybody dies. And we understand that people get old and they get sick and they die. We understand accidental deaths, that people step off the curb, they get hit by a bus and they die. They get in a traffic accident, they die. I think, was it in Tacoma? There were six people that were killed and three people, two of them critically injured, three people injured uh, this morning in Tacoma on 509 by the port in Tacoma, a two-car accident. Uh, we understand that people die in accidents like that. We understand homicide. I've gone to, to multiple homicides, and uh, homicides are ugly things to have to deal with. But you can understand a homicide. They, the person didn't do it. Somebody did it to them. But suicide is unique because this person made a decision. This person was intent about doing this. And for that reason, I think it's the most traumatic of deaths for those who are survivors. A suicide survivor, by the way, is not somebody who survives a suicide attempt. A suicide survivor is the family and friends of a person who died by suicide. They are survivors of suicide loss. Survivors have anger. But in our culture, the viewed as a victim and survivors often misdirect their blame. They blame each other, they blame themselves, they blame God for the choice that the suicidal subject made. We play that what-if game that I've already talked about. At the funeral, all who knew the subject are shocked and distressed by the suicide. They need comfort and hope. And uh, this is directed more probably toward those who are leading such funerals or involved in such funerals, but be honest with the mourners. Don't lie, don't mislead them, don't hide or avoid the fact that this was a suicide. You don't have to dwell on it. When I preach at a, the death of, I preach at the funeral for somebody who's committed suicide, I don't go into all the details of why they may or may not have committed suicide or the gory details of what they did. But I can acknowledge at the beginning this person died by suicide. We may not understand it. We may not approve of it. But that's a reality. That's a fact. Now let's go on. But it needs to at least be acknowledged. Acknowledge briefly at the outset that so-and-so took his or her own life. While we may not understand why they did that, judgment belongs to the Lord. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? People often want me to make a judgment about somebody that I don't even know. You know, is my loved one in heaven? Is my loved one in hell? I don't know. But I don't need to know. Will not the judge of all the earth do right? God knows that person. God knows their heart. God knows their mind. God knows their actions. God knows their faith or their lack of faith. We have to... In the end, leave it to God, but go on to offer hope and life in Jesus Christ. I don't know about him, but what about you? Some things to say. I'm going to run through this kind of quickly because we can really say some things that are hurtful to people in the aftermath of a suicide, and we can say some other things that are really helpful. Some things to say are things like this. I'm here to help you as much as I can. I can't, I can't make it all better, but how can I help you? What can I do? 
you won't have to face this alone. We're here with you, arm around the shoulder, if it's uh, appropriate. This must be very hard for you. That goes without saying, but it's helpful to say it, actually. What you're describing to me sounds very normal under these circumstances. People talking about the feelings that they have, the confusion that they have, the complexities of their emotions. That sounds very normal. I would be glad to help you with that or go there with you. Got to go make some decisions. I don't want to go by myself. I'll be here when you need me. I know you must feel like that. I'll pray for you and your family. Um, our, culture, our culture at large has really attacked this kind of statement. But uh, it's still very true. The most important thing that we can do for people who are suffering is to pray for them. Who are suffering enormous loss, pray for them. Some things not to say. It must have been God's will. God ordains all things to come to pass, right? But uh, this is not the best time to make that argument. Just let it go. Um, somebody's hurting. I've heard these, some of these things I've heard. At least you still have another brother or parent or child or close friend. Three, you, you, can, you can find another girlfriend. There are, you know, many fish in the sea. People say, I understand. And sometimes you get a reaction. Do you? Do you really? Have you been where I am? And if you have, you can say, yeah, I have. But if you haven't, you come up empty. And you're revealed. Um, don't say that unless you have suffered similar loss. Are you okay? Sounds like a caring question, doesn't it? I learned the hard way. <clears throat> Went to a 911 call. Someone was uh, in bed, dying. They called 911. When we arrived, uh, she had died. Uh, her mother was out shopping. We waited for the mother to come back and uh, informed, notified the mother that her daughter had died, adult daughter had died. She'd been sick. She died. And uh, the mother wanted to go in and be with her daughter, and, uh, and I went with her. And at, at some point, I just kind of said to her, are you okay? And she looked at me. She turned and looked at me. And she said, am I okay? What do you think? My daughter is here dead. I'm not okay. Well, I never said that again. Never asked that question again. I rephrased it. How are you doing? You tell me. I'm not going to ask you, are you okay? I'm not going to second guess how you're feeling. Tell me, how are you doing? I've never gotten a negative response on, on that question, okay? So keep that in mind. Don't tell people it will be okay. With respect to suicide, it won't be okay. Don't tell people, don't talk like that. They'll come back and say, I can say anything I want. You can't tell me what to say. Don't, don't go there. Don't tell them time heals all wounds. Because it doesn't. Don't tell them, just pray about it. I'm not saying don't urge them to pray. But that word just doesn't belong there. You're not the only one who's gone through this, you know. But it's not helpful. Everyone has to die sometime. That's true. But it's not helpful. The Lord must have wanted him. Why are you walking around? Okay. The devil got into him and made him do it. Another way of evading the reality that this person made a choice. You shouldn't feel that way. Don't tell me how to feel. You're young. You can remarry. Not the time. No. Not the message you want to convey. You just got to get over it and move on. You don't get over it. You never will. Uh, these books are available. The, uh, 
At that time, I only had the, the um, uh, My Friend is Suicidal, but um, now the sequel to that, uh, Someone I Love Died by Suicide, is also available. Those are up on the table in the entryway. They are free. Take them for yourself. Take them to give to somebody. If you want, take some to have on hand. They're not doing any good sitting in my house. I can get another box. They need to be out. So if you can use them, please do. And bear in mind these scriptures. I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. And the words of our Lord, come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Ultimately, the way that we can help people is to bring them to the feet of Jesus Christ. He's the comforter. He and spirit are the comforter. He's the one who can change their hearts, comfort them, encourage them, and give them hope. Let's pray. Father, we've talked about a lot of things tonight. We pray that it has been a helpful time that we will minister to each other, that we'll minister to those in our fellowship who are hurting, that we can minister to those uh, who may have nothing to do with this particular death by suicide, but who are contemplating suicide, family members, friends. Make us useful in your kingdom. Help us to glorify your name, we pray. Through Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I thought we would have some time for questions. I'm open to that, but I don't want to hold you if you don't want to be held. Do we have any questions? Okay. I'm here. We're dismissed. If you want to talk to me, I'm here. You've got my number. Thank you.